I'm obsessed with butterflies because I'm obsessed with, I'm obsessed with metamorphosis. I'm obsessed with, uh, I mean, you can't see it. I wish you could, but there's a whole butterfly garden outside. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I, I do that every spring. And then, um, in the fall, there's just hundreds of butterflies that come and to watch these ugly little worms crawling on their belly, which I'm very familiar with being an ugly worm crawling on my belly to dream about becoming a butterfly to look at the butterfly and go, oh my God, could you imagine if I could be like that? Like that must be amazing to be able to be like that. Not knowing the whole time mm. that we're all like that. And all we have to do is become still, create our own chrysalis around ourselves, cocoon chrysalis, mm -hmm. and, and be still and, and tap into the unlimited resource, unlimited well of, of power to transform ourselves. And then eventually we become brave enough to take away the chrysalis and emerge from, from the cocoon. And there we are, ironically enough, that big, beautiful butterfly that we always dreamed of being. It's so beautiful, it's so beautiful. I wanna properly introduce you because I know we just have so much to chat about and this is just sure. be such a beautiful, natural conversation. Khalil is the founder of Sun Life Organics. It's not a smoothie or a juice shop. It's a place for transformation and human connection, a place where people can go and really feel truly that they're loved and that they matter. I went to um, one about a year ago and was just blown away. I went to the mm. Austin location. I recently bought, brought our uh, six-year-old daughter to the one here in Miami. You literally walk into this place and you feel so important. These people are being 100% present with you, which especially now, at this time is just so crucial and so precious. And you literally, you know, you don't know how much impact you can have on someone's life from that one connection. And so I was so um, just blown away by how this place felt. And as an entrepreneur, you know, I'm like going in there and like, just kind of thinking about it with that mindset, like how did this person create this? And then I found your book mm. and started to read about your story. And I absolutely want to share that with my listeners because it's just so incredible. So, so Thank incredible you. what you came from and um, that you choose, you chose to move past. So can you share a little bit just from, you know, the times when you were really struggling, what that looked like for you? Um, well, I mean, I was really struggling most of my life. So <laughs> do you want to pick an era of struggle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, there's one of the excerpts, I think, from your book. I actually printed it out here. I found this so interesting. I'm going to just read it right from here. At 33, and by the way, everyone can see you're a very healthy person. Anyone who follows you, you're <laughs> you're a go-getter. You're working out. You're spreading the message of love. And at 33... I am now. I, I am now. When I when At 33, I was 109 pounds. So, And a convicted felon a high yes. school dropout, a homeless yes. junkie living in Skid Row in downtown LA. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, and a lot, there was a lot of other shame piled on top of that. Not, not just living my life without a moral compass, but also um, what I had to do to get drugs in terms of using my body to let men do stuff to me so I could have money for drugs there was a lot of that in the book. And then the person who helped me edit the book was like, Hey, like that's too much. Like just uh -huh. give, give a reference to it. Let people use their imagination and then back off because otherwise it's going to be too polarizing for people. Mm -hmm. I, in hindsight, I regret that a little bit, even though he had ghostwritten 16 New York times bestsellers. I obviously had to listen to him, but I get so many messages from people about, you know, doing certain things that they feel like they've sold a piece of their soul. And my, and my point is like, look, we're all strippers. We're all prostitutes in one way or another. We're also all, you know, good people and saints in another way. Like we, we do the best that we can with the strengths that we have, but we fall apart in our, in, in our weaknesses that, that are, that are unique to us. I did some things to get some money for drugs. Big deal. I'm not, I'm not embarrassed of that. I'm not ashamed of that. I don't feel like shame 
serves anyone. It doesn't serve me. It doesn't serve you. It doesn't serve your listeners. Yeah. Um, when I was early on in recovery, I had nowhere to live. Like people think like, oh yeah, he got sober and then he became a millionaire. Now he's flying around the world on private jets. Like, right. Like it just happens like that. Yeah. No, there, I was homeless almost three years into my recovery. And at eight months, I met a woman who was older and had a bunch of money. And I mean, she was awesome. She was very pretty. And, um, but full transparency, like I needed a roof over my head and she had one, a really nice roof. And I ended up moving in with her and she ended up taking care of me. And there was a silent agreement. There was an arrangement there that I had to do what I had to do to, you know, pay the rent. And I, I didn't talk about that for years because I did feel shame over it. And then I just thought to myself, what, what is, what, what purpose does that serve? There, there's probably a lot of people out there that in one way or another have been in situations like that, um, or were working a job for someone that they absolutely despised, but they work there anyway. And they felt like they were selling their soul. It's almost like being a stripper, right? You ask a stripper, you know, I'm like, my God, you're, you're, you, you seem like such an amazing young woman. What are you, what are you doing, doing this? And they're like, the money's so good. I can't stop. And I get that. I totally get that. So, yeah. um, yeah, pretty, pretty rough childhood, pretty rough, um, adolescent and, and youth and throughout my teen years. And it just, you know, my blackout drinking that we were talking about, I think before we started the podcast eventually led to more drugs and then harder drugs and then harder drugs. And, and don't get me wrong. There was, there was some amazing, there was a, there was an amazing honeymoon period. I mean, I was in a rock and roll band. I was dating some B and C list actresses and models and living in Malibu. And there, there was some cool times. I don't, I don't regret, I don't regret a lot of it. Um, but most of it was just a wilderness of pain. Yeah. There's so much to pull just from what you just talked about. And so this, you know, my goal with this platform is I love helping people get unstuck, right? So just like you talked about, we all I think we all, whether they're like big challenges or traumas or, you know, sacrifices that we make in our lives with ourself, with our soul, we all experience guilt, shame. We all do things that I think at one point or another, we're not proud of, um, you know, to what extent I think that varies, but it all boils down to the same kind of feelings, right? I think we all wear masks. We all have yes. these deep seated feelings of guilt, shame, not good enough that all I think boil down to really like a lack of connection, right? We feel disconnected. Yes. Um, we feel not good enough. And I think that's part of Khalil, what hit me so hard with your story. It's like, although probably a lot of people that will listen to this in particular, weren't doing drugs and weren't blackout drunk and weren't living on skid row and going through those life-threatening challenges that you went through a lot of these people, myself included, we all show up wearing masks at different times in our lives. We all show up, um, you know, with guilt and shame and they don't serve us. And so what I've wanted to do with my platform is create a place where like, let's talk about that. Let's go deep. Let's, let's talk about the things that we could be ashamed of that we've done. And then let's also talk about together how we get through them. So like, what do we do on the daily that helps us show up without the masks, that helps us be vulnerable, um, that helps us, you know, take care of ourselves so that we can help connect with others and serve other people. So, you know, your story to me has been such a glimmer of hope. And I know, you know, from the distance watching your transition, there had to be so many things that you went through where you could give up. And again, I think those feelings, probably a lot of them that you went through are very relatable to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in order to, to do anything, you need a power and you need a method, right? Um, there are very, very few methods out there for people that are suffering from alcoholism and, and addiction. And I would imagine most of the people listening to this are not. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of my, whatever it is following, I don't know, we know what word to use. Most of the people that, that, that follow me and appreciate my story are not drug addicts and alcoholics. They are people who are not where they want to be in their life. And they see me and they go, holy shit if that guy can do it, I can do it. Right. Mm -hmm. I think, I think if there's any, if there's any great 
strength and if there's anything original about my story, um, when I would read books about Jack Dorsey or I would listen to podcasts and hear about guys like Tim Ferriss or, you know, Huberman, who I love and I've become very close with, um, or, or, or many of these guys, they, a lot of them came from good families. A lot of them came, you know, were the grand recipients of nepotism, generational wealth. Um, most of them were highly, highly educated. And so it's hard for me to like read about an Elon Musk and then get inspired because I'm not a genius. Right. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even finish high school. In fact, I couldn't even do sixth grade properly. I got held back in sixth grade, I got held back in kindergarten and sixth grade. Always felt like I was a dummy. Always felt like I didn't fit in. Um, I wasn't good enough. And yeah, lots of shame. The sexual abuse left me with just a film of, of shame and guilt. Um, and that's a multi faceted um, whole rabbit hole we can go down at some point, maybe in a future podcast. But, you know, for people who suffer from sexual abuse, there's strangely enough, there is guilt about it um, because you you start to question yourself like, well, did I go seeking that attention? Or if you are sexually traumatized as a child, you end up going out and looking for similar attention because you learn that that's how you can get attention. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something that's really talked about a whole lot for, for a multitude of reasons. But um, with, with my story, you kind of have it all. You got the high school dropout, not, not <laughs> clearly not that right. Um, not a whole lot of talents. Um, if any, I mean, maybe I can talk well, good, however you're supposed to say mm -hmm. it, but, um, <laughs> I don't like, I didn't have talents. I was terrible at sports. I never fit in. I'm, I'm, I'm shaped a little bit funny. It's hard to tell on Instagram because I know the right angles, but like <laughs> I have a massive skull my torso is a little bit too long and my legs are a little bit too short. As a, 53 year old, <laughs> well, as a 53 year old man, most of my body dysmorphia has dissipated. Most of my manorexia has dissipated. But as a kid, mm -hmm. when other kids were brutally making fun of me um, or, or even into high school, when people used to laugh and point out like how, how I was shaped, you know, dwarf like, um, even though I'm 5'8", um, I just, my, my torso and my legs are just a little bit off. It's funny to be now. It's funny to me now, but it was brutal as a kid growing oh, up sure. yeah. well into my thirties. So, um, to have all of that seemingly going against me, I mean, one would think I have a tattoo on my head that my massive forehead that says born to lose. Um, and yet here I am uh -huh. winning. And yeah. And how, okay. Let's, let's dissect that. Sure. Cause that's, that's the beauty, right? Like we've all read the books of the person who's, who's like born into, of course, of course he could do it. Of course she could do it. How did you do it? Well, I got into so much pain that I changed. I got into so much pain that I didn't really have any other options, but to change. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about having the abscesses and living under a bridge and smoking crack and shooting heroin. Like, yeah, of course my body physically gave out at 33 years old. I couldn't, I couldn't walk from here to my mailbox without gasping for air. Mm -hmm. Um, that was, you know, a horrible, horrible, horrible bottom. But then, you know, going into my early recovery and not having my own apartment and realizing I'm in my mid thirties and I don't have any skills. And I can't type, I can't spell, um, like, what am I going to do? I mean, sure. I have the job in a rehab. Anybody can get a job in a rehab. They would, they, they would hire Charles Manson at, at a rehab, even if it was a high end rehab, they're desperate for, for, uh, techs, they called us. Mm -hmm. Um, but what, what was I possibly going to do? So then there was another bottoming out and that came in the form of my mom getting sick uh, my mom was always frail, um, but my mom got cancer when she was in her late sixties and she called me and she told me, and I did my best to put on a front, you know, like, oh, okay, well, you know, you'll be all right. And my mom, my little Polish immigrant mother is like, well, you know, please lamb, can you come see me? Can you come visit me? I didn't have the money. I was a fucking loser. I had ruined my entire life. 
So forget about the bottom of drugs and alcohol. How about that for a bottom? When, when, the, when the woman, and I don't care whether she was a good mom or not, she wasn't, but she carried me in her belly. She gave me life. I ate her, her, the minerals from her bones while I was inside her stomach, her hair fell out, her skin, the collagen left her skin. Like my mother literally gave me life Mm -hmm. and I was such a fucking loser that I couldn't go visit her. Forget about helping her. I could, of course I couldn't help her. I had no money, but I couldn't even go visit her. I got off the phone and my friend was like, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. And he dropped me off at he was letting me stay in his guest house because he had a big property and they were doing construction on the main house. The guest house didn't have electricity, but it had running water and he was letting me stay there for free. Mm. And I didn't have anywhere to go. He dropped me off there that, that evening and by candlelight, um, I cried and I cried and I cried and I was punching myself in my thighs over and over again. And I was grinding my teeth and I was so disgusted with myself that I was there, I was almost 35 years old, such a fucking loser that I couldn't help the one person on earth that I should have been able to help. That was the bottom of all bottoms. That's when I knew definitively what a piece of shit I had become by my own doing. The one thing I don't like about 12 step programs is there's a lot of people sitting around complaining and I, I want to be crystal clear. I did not get high because I was sexually abused and I did not get high because my father was a rageaholic and a monster that, who beat my mother. I did not get high because when I begged my mother to stop my old, much older half sibling to stop molesting me, she shooed me away and said, he's just tickling you. I didn't get high because of that stuff. I got high because it felt great. I got high because I was awake. I got high because my happiness, I was so selfish and self-centered that my happiness came before you or your children or the police or society or, or anybody. Mm-hmm. And I conceded to my innermost self in that moment that like, I'm a fucking loser. Like I, I messed up my whole life. This sucks. And that's when I just like, again, folded my hands in desperation. And I was like, God, please, God, please. So I mentioned you need a method. The method for me was 12 steps in the beginning. There's Mm -hmm. many other methods. If you're not an alcoholic or a drug addict, the power was God. I was powerless. I did not have power. I sought God with all my heart and God, God made me new again. God crowned my head with love. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not anything. I don't have the right to represent any religion because if I do, I'm going to misrepresent it sooner or later. Mm. But I am a man that wholeheartedly believes in God. And Psalm 103, one through five, that's my story that I sought God with all my heart. That was my power. And then knowing, feeling that I had that power, I went to work. I just, I just went to work and one day at a time, which they taught me in 12 step programs, one step at a time, one week, one month, one year at a time, I slowly began to reemerge and as a new man, as a new character. And, um, and it was brutal and it was hard and it it was, it was years of grinding it out, but Mm -hmm. I wanted to change. So I think for people out there who are living a life that they don't want to be living, you have to first ask yourself, honestly, do you really want to change? Do you really want to change? Because I I, I was talking this morning about a, a friend of mine who, who lives here with his mom and they, and the, the dad, the stepdad is this horrible monster of a human being, according to them. So fucking leave, mm-hmm. right? If, if, if they're no longer serving love at the table, get up and walk out of the restaurant. Yeah. Unless you don't really want to change because maybe you like that SUV or maybe you like that lifestyle that you get to live. And if that's the case, then you know, then you stay. But if you really want to change, you ask God for help and help will come, but then you got to do the footwork. Yep. So that's, it almost sounds like that's the overarching really principal message. You want to make changes in your life. You first have to want to change. Yes. Cause it's not going to be easy and you got to do the work. Yeah. And the truth is most people don't want to change. Yeah. I mean, I was a counselor for 10 years. I owned Riviera recovery. I, I get, you know, 
hundreds of messages a month from people that are like, Hey man, you know, I, I, I want to be like you, like, can, can I open up a sun life in, you know, wherever in, in, Del, in Del Rey and, you know, you can like set it up, but I'll run it for you and blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, so, so you saw that Dan Bilzerian follows me and, mm -hmm. and you think that that's how life works, mm -hmm. that someone's just going to give you a business. And when they say they want to be like me, they mean they want to hang out backstage with Anthony Kiedis, or they want to go on tour with so-and-so, or they want to go to Kelly Slater's wave pool. All of that stuff is cool, but none of that is what allows me to look at myself in the mirror when I get up in the morning and smile and say, you know what, man, you're doing pretty good. Yeah. You do pretty that. good. Do you, so when you boil it down, like the people who don't want to change, cause like a lot of the people I'm speaking to are people that feel stuck and so yeah. maybe subconsciously they don't even realize it, but maybe they're stuck because really they don't want to change. So if we boil down, you know, I think this is an interesting conversation. Like, why wouldn't someone want to change? And not just about you want the SUV, you want the car. Like, what do you think those things are really about when you boil them down? In my, I have to plug my computer in. In my experience as a counselor, both working in the rehabs and um, and owning Riviera Recovery, it was usually like parents would put their kid there or a husband would put their wife there or vice versa, a wife would put their husband there. For your audience, if they're listening to you and they and they genuinely do want to change, I would imagine there's a lot of fear around changing or self-doubt. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to pivot a little bit away from the drugs and the drama, and I'm just going to deliver this message, which I realized pretty recently. When we're scared, when we're jealous, when we're gossiping, when we are behaving in a way, you know, they say hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. Like, like you'll never see, you'll never, you'll never see anybody who's living an amazing life, spending any amount of their time talking shit about somebody else. It so just good. doesn't happen. I, I am blessed and privileged to be friends with Kings and Queens and rock stars and movie stars and billionaires, not because I'm special, but because I feed people and I open businesses in very expensive neighborhoods and those people want friends and um which i didn't know i didn't realize that until about 12 years ago when i first opened my business if you feed people and you don't ask them for anything sooner or later they want company they want somebody to go sit front row at the ufc fight or they want somebody to come on tour with them because they don't want to deal with groupies now that they're in their 50s they want someone to go get a decent meal with people who are successful and happy don't try and hurt other people mm -hmm. when you see somebody being attacked online it's usually somebody who is successful and has something that other people want that they that they don't have so they try to attack them and bring them down yeah. you know mm -hmm. um, so when we are hurt when we're jealous when we're full of shame when we're full of fear we're we're contracted mm -hmm. we're contracted okay and when we are full of love and when we are confident and when we feel aligned, we are expansive. And when we are expansive, we get to welcome in the change that we want. So when we're fearful, it's like we're praying for what we don't want. When we have faith, that's why the whole God thing is so important to me. Because when I feel like I am, I am protected, I am cared for, I am loved by God, then I'm expansive. And then I get to dream. I give myself permission to dream. I give myself permission to go, you know, I'm, I'm going to make that necessary change. And then my whole little philosophy of like 1% better, I didn't create that. That I mean, I heard about that from Tim Ferriss 15 years ago when I was reading his book and he was talking about the Japanese philosophy of Kaizen. Kaizen is getting a tiny little bit better every day over a sustained period of time brings about monumental results. Ooh, and then there, was, then there was a guy that wrote a book called The Power of Habit. Um, and then there was an even smarter guy who stole the idea from The Power of Habit and wrote a book called Atomic Habits. This is just philosophy that's been regurgitated over and over and over again. And by the way, Atomic Habits is an amazing book. He also says 1% better. Many people have said 1% better. Mm -hmm. When I'm expansive and I'm wel welcoming in the things, the power, the energies, the people into my life, um, then great things start to happen. 
when I'm contracted, when I'm scared, when I'm jealous, when I'm vengeful, when I'm angry, I'm contracting and I'm pushing it all away. And I'm going to just give one example and, and your listeners probably don't even know who Rick Rubin is, but Rick is a mentor of mine. It's strangely enough, he's a music producer, but we've never talked about music. We've talked about life, meditation, love. Okay. Rick was coming into Sun Life about 10 years ago and he, he had really taken an interest in me and he decided to extend himself to me, invited me over to do saunas and ice baths long before anybody was doing that stuff. And sometimes Rick would be standoffish with me and sometimes he would be very open with me and very present and available. And I couldn't understand what was going on. And I asked his girlfriend, I was like, I get the feeling like he doesn't like me sometimes. And she said, you should read a book called non, non I think it's called nonviolent communication. Oh. And I was like, why? And she said, because sometimes when you're talking, you sound angry and you sound vengeful. And Ricky doesn't like that. Ricky does not appreciate that energy. And then I started to watch myself. If it's a good day and Cindy Crawford walks in and I get to treat her to a million dollar smoothie, I feel amazing. But if it's a bad day and the landlord is using the lease that I innocently signed without having a lawyer look at it against me, all of a sudden it's a shitty day and I'm yes. angry. Yes. And Rick walks in and I'm like, you wouldn't believe what my so-and-so landlord did. And he's just, he's like this. Wow. Yeah. This is a guy that's been meditating twice a day since he was 14 years old. Oh my and gosh. He's, and he's 59. Do you know who I'm talking about? Rick Rubin with the long beard? No, I don't. I'll have to look. Oh, he's Maybe if I see his face. Okay. He's fascinating. He just wrote a book. It's not out yet. It comes out next year, but he gave me his book and it's so cool. It's, a, it's about a lot of what we're talking about. Oh, okay. So, I'm going to check um, his stuff out for sure. Yeah. So for your people that are stuck, like ask yourself if you really want to change. And then if you really want to change, then, and by the way, you don't have to believe in God. That's just my method. You know, mm -hmm. find something, find a, an amazing podcaster that you can get power from or find the strength from your husband or your girlfriends or, or, you know, get a support group and, and, and get a power and get a method and just go for it and start making little tiny incremental changes practiced on a daily basis over a sustained period of time. And I promise you, I promise you, you will look in the mirror one day sooner than you think, and you'll barely recognize yourself. Mm, I love it. That sounds so doable. Can we pivot with that? Because I imagine health fueling your body with healthy food, because that's really part of your mission too. And I know that's part of your story. What, what helped impact some of your changes when someone started feeding you nourishing food. So I'm curious how big of a piece of the puzzle now today at 53, do you feel that what you do for your body and what you put in your body makes an impact in how you, how you feel when you look in the mirror? It's so intrinsically related and it's so paramount that I get up and I move, that I sweat every single day. I don't care if, if it's 10 minutes of movement, which it never is, it's, it's much more than that. But in the beginning, it, it was you know really just getting out of bed, getting outside, walking, moving, breathing, mm -hmm. <sighs> big deep breaths. Because if you're anything like me, you take tiny little shallow breaths, which makes you very anxious and again, when you're doing shallow breaths, you are constricting, you are contracting. When you're yes. taking big, giant, deep inhalations in through your nose, you are expanding. So early on, the guy that was cutting my hair for free, God bless him, Matthew Priest in Santa Monica. If any of you live in Santa Monica, go see Matthew Priest at the Matthew Priest Salon. Um, he's this fancy hairdresser and I was walking through Fred Siegel at the time and I, I'm embarrassed to say I used to straighten my hair. I had long hair and I used I've to straighten I've seen some pictures. It. I've seen some pictures. Oh, you saw it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I was walking through Fred Siegel. I was working at the rehab and I was taking a client there to go shopping and I walked past Fred Siegel hair and Matthew worked there at the time and he remembered me and he goes, he's like, oh, he's like, Khalil. I'm like, yeah. He's like, how you doing, mate? I'm like, I'm all right. And he's like, he's like, God, God your, your hair is awful. 
And me being so insecure and so vain, I, I like threw some harsh language at him and he was like, buddy, relax. I'm just saying, if you need a haircut, come see me. Mm. And again, I got very defensive and I said, I don't have $300 for a fucking haircut. And he goes, right. And I'm not charging you. Mm, Cause you were here instead of here. Yes. And so he started cutting my hair and he chopped it all off and he made me let it go natural. And of course that afternoon I started getting compliment after compliment, which I hadn't had in a long time. Which opens you up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the second time he cut my hair, he gave me a bunch of Tony Robbins um, CDs and DVDs. He cuts Tony's hair, or he did cut Tony's hair. I don't know if he cuts it anymore, but he gave me the CDs and there was this thing called Hour of Power. Oh. And I would get up in the morning and I would go walk these dogs because that was one of my jobs. And I would do these breathing exercises where you would tap, you would do this tapping thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you would sort of like in syncopation, like you would do it and you would do the breathing exercises with the tapping, like. And I, and I would do that for like seven to 10 minutes, which would oxygenate my brain and oxygenate my body. And then you do these out loud, what Tony wants you doing them out loud, where you would say like every day and every way I'm getting stronger and stronger. He's got every his incantations. Day. And it seems so stupid, <laughs> but it is so powerful. And the best part at the end of the hike, because I would take the dogs up Bonzel Canyon, at the end of the hike, he would make you do this visualization where you would visualize all the things that you dreamed about. And mine was, it's funny because I dreamed about and visualized a Volvo SUV. That was my dream car. Don't ask me why. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I got one. I got like six of them actually over the last 20 years. But Volvo SUV, I wanted a juice bar um, and I wanted to write a book and I wanted a girlfriend. And so... Uh -huh. I would visualize myself driving in an SUV with this beautiful girl and holding her hand. And I would visualize myself writing a book and having a book and signing books for people. And I would visualize what my juice bar would look like. And it would have crystals in it and it would have real plants and it would have paintings. And I'm grateful for the fact that I didn't know any better that what I'm trying to say is I wholeheartedly believed, even though I had the doubting voice in my head, like you're a piece of shit, you're a loser, you're too old, life has passed you by, that never went away. Mm -hmm. But in here, I actually believed like, well, the, if I do this, then that stuff's going to happen. I watched The Secret. Remember The Secret? Yeah. yeah. So I watched The Secret. I read As a Man Thinketh, and I was doing that hour of power. Mm -hmm. And... You know, like a year and a half in, I started to see a lot of doors opening, being expansive. Uh -huh. And um, my faith just kept getting more and more reassured. So it's kind of like when you go looking for the good in the world, when you go looking for proof that miracles still happen and they happen on a daily basis, you're going to find that proof. 100%. But if you watch enough CNN or you watch enough Fox News and you allow them to program all that fear into you and you and you contract and you believe that miracles can happen the miracles aren't going to happen so i'm like that woman that started spanx not i mean she's a genius i'm not but i'm just like her because she didn't know that you can't just make a clothing brand and call up macy's and say hey i want to bring my stuff and it doesn't work like that right mm -hmm. but it did Right, because she the guy that answered the phone, he, he caught he somehow got the guy on the phone and he literally was chuckling and he literally was like, OK, sure, come on in. It doesn't work like that. And that was one of her first major orders. And she went on, obviously, to become a billionaire and marry that amazing guy, Jesse. Mm -hmm. um, I was like her in the fact that I didn't know that you couldn't just like go for a hike, read a couple books say your chants and your incantations out loud, visualize the future that you want. But I'm telling you now, 19 years later, it was probably about 17 years later, actually. Now I wholeheartedly know that it's real. 
It's it is real. It's hundred percent. You visualize it and you do the work. I mean, it's silly to have little motivational mugs like this that say things like this. Oh, I love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah. So, you know, if Beyonce can do it, I can do it. If Jay-Z can do it, I can do it. All of us are capable of any type of change we want, but we have to first believe that, mm -hmm. whether that's through naivete or lack of intelligence in my case, or whether that's through inspiration or, or whether that's through the church or temple or mosque or whatever it is, but just get inspired. And, and, and here's the most important thing. Sorry, I'm rambling, but here's the most important thing. Michael Cartwright, who was my boss at the time when I was working at this rehab that he owned, he had this Southern drawl and he had these like really blue eyes that had like light coming from them and he was super rich. So I was very impressed mm -hmm. and I was nobody. I was a loser. I was a tech. And he said, uh, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. I was a little bit nervous because he owned the place and he was never there. He lived in Nashville. And um, he said, you're a producer. And I said, no, 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 I, I work here. He goes, hear me out, hear me out. You're a producer. I'm like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I can see it. I can recognize producers. So I want to take you to dinner next week. I want you to pick out a restaurant. I'm like, okay. He goes, I'll be back on Tuesday. And I'm like, oh shit, okay. So following week, we go to this restaurant, we sit down. He looks around and he goes, did you go online and find out what the most expensive restaurant in town was? <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. He goes, you did. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, why would you do that? And I said, because I wanted to impress you. And he knew I meant it. Mm -hmm. He thought maybe I was doing it because I was an asshole. Yeah. I was doing it because I was terrified that I wasn't going to measure up to what he thought I was. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, I want you to go home after we're done tonight. And I want you to write down a one year, a three year and a five year plan. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you all the magic here. <laughs> you don't have to hire me. You don't have to read my books. This is it. Write down a one year, three year and a five year plan and be very descriptive. And when he said it, I went to start talking like, yeah, I want to open up my own recovery. So he goes, nope, write it down and be as descriptive as possible. And remember, this is when I was doing those hikes with the incantations and the breathing exercises. Yeah. I was being expansive. I was attracting the people into my life that I needed in that moment. Here's the great irony. I did exactly what he said. He ended up paying for me to start taking some courses and some classes. So then I could become a counselor. And then eventually I became an interventionist. And then eventually I became a sober companion, which... I went from making minimum wage to getting paid a thousand dollars a day. And I was really, really good at what I did. And I had confidence and I was being expansive and I was doing all the footwork. The crazy part is about a year later, he ended up firing me. <laughs> he was so mad at me for something I did and he fired me and it was really hostile, but it didn't matter. I probably deserved to get fired, but here's the best part. So like seven years later, I wrote my book. And I wrote about Michael Cartwright, changed my life. Mm -hmm. And someone sent it to him and he read it Aww. and he tracked me down and he called me and he was in tears. He said, I can't even believe you remember me. I'm like, Michael, you changed my life. He had no idea. You said one thing which changed my life. You told me that I was a producer. I thought you had me confused as one of the clients because I didn't know what a producer was. All Michael meant was you are someone that can make things happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if that was true up until that point, but the moment he said that to me and I was willing to receive that message, yeah. it became very true. Because I often say to people now, I can do anything. I can do anything. I'm just barely scratching the surface of how successful I'm going to be and how many people I'm going to help and how many books I'm going to write, how many locations I'm going to open. That all co goes back to that. That man in one sentence reversed decades of my father telling me, you're a piece of shit. You're a bum. You're a fucking loser. You're just like your goddamn mother. You're always going to be broke. I heard that so many times. And it, it hurts my heart to say that out loud because he's still alive mm. and we don't talk. No. And, and, and the worst part about it is he doesn't get to experience any of this. You know, I tried, 
I tried about 10 years ago. I reached out to him and I did what I did with my mom. I spoiled the shit out of him. I bought him things. I got him a fancy car and I got him a new wardrobe and everything. And the more I gave, the more he wanted. So on this big journey of getting unstuck, make sure you have boundaries. Make sure you have boundaries because when you start to change and you start to become successful, like crabs in a basket, your friends and your family are going to try to pull you down and they don't even know why. Mm -hmm. They don't even know why they're trying to pull you down. If you rise up out of that basket, that means that they have the same ability to rise up out of that basket. And that's scary. So true. Yeah. It's not the dark that scares us. It's the light. Yes, of course. Right. And we when we think that we need to play small for people. I'm not playing small for anybody anymore. I am a deeply flawed man. I have a lot of character defects. I, I am also barely scratching the surface on, on becoming the man that God intended me to become. Having said that, I'm on my way. And I'm, I'm, I'm not yet what I should be. I'm not even close to what I could be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. Oh, I love that. That's so beautiful. So many, so many beautiful messages. I feel like I could hold you here and keep you for hours and days and days because you just have so much to share. Um, thank you. Thank you for putting into words. I feel like without even realizing it, that was a really big part of why I started this. I live that way. I believe all those things to be true. Yeah. I watch The Secret. I believe it. And I think where it gets a bad rap is that it's not like you want a Volkswagen SUV and it just appears. What happens is you want it, you think about it, you become expansive and you're then open to all these opportunities that present in front of you, that present in front of everyone every single day. But, but they don't wake, believe it. When you wake up and you watch CNN or you watch Fox yes. News and you're like this, you're not going to see them. Right. And so literally that power hour, when I heard Tony Robbins say that, that is what changed my life. And I'm very- Oh, so you know. Yes, I'm very protective of that morning time. Like nobody can come in because that's when I I could wake up starting here. I think that's my yeah. default, to be honest. I'm not by yeah. nature like an open, energetic person. I work to get there. Yeah, so for that sure. When I go out, I'm this. And yeah. that's when stuff just comes at you. Nobody, nobody has better luck, I don't think, than anyone else. I think it's very much about being present, being expansive, and and seeing it in front of you. You yeah, I mean, you create your luck. And let and let's just, you know, I don't want to uh, keep babbling, but I do want to talk about like the, the Volvo thing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't have a Volvo anymore, but I did, I did for, for 16 years, I drove those Volvo SUVs. It was a weird thing. I had just gotten sober and I was in the back of, uh, it was Jack Osborne. Actually, I was with Jack Osborne. I don't know how, why, how or why I think I was at Alex Orbison's house. Jack Osborne was there. That's when they were like still pretty famous, the Osbournes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess they still are, but, um, and we were going to get something and I got in the back of this Volvo SUV and I just remember I was so poor. I mean, my God, I, I didn't have a whole lot of hope at that time, but I remember touching the seats and I remember the smell and I remember thinking how safe it felt. Mm -hmm. And I just inwardly, I was like, I'm going to get one of these one day. I'm going to get one of these one day. Well, two years later, um, I'm working my ass off. I'm working, I'm working at a horrible rehab called Malibu ranch. I'm walking Lou Gossett jr's dogs. I'm doing errands for Cindy Landon. And I was Billy Bob, Billy. I'm sound like a disgusting LA name dropper, but this is who I worked with. Yeah. You can't swing a dead cat in Malibu without hitting a famous person. So just bear with me sure. if you haven't thrown up yet. No. Um, I was Billy Bob and Pietra's uh, Manny. I was taking care of their boys, teaching them how to boogie board. And I'm, I'm at Cross Creek one afternoon and I see Fred Siegel and he's talking with somebody. And I knew who Fred Siegel was. Fred Siegel was like this legendary mythical man in retail. And um, I knew he owned the fanciest rehab in town. I mean, this place was 300 acres. The Dalai Lama stayed there. Like yeah. this was the rehab. And I couldn't help myself much like I don't have boundaries. I just stood up and I walked over to his table and I was like, hi, Mr. Siegel. I would love to work at your rehab. And he goes, it's Freddie. I'm like, uh, hi, Freddie. I would love to work with at your, at your, I was like stumbling over my words. And he goes, do you have a pen? And I said, no. And he goes, well, go get a goddamn pen. That was Fred Siegel. 
And I ran into the coffee bean. I cut the line. I walked up. I grabbed one of their Sharpies, <laughs> ran out, went back to the table. And he said, call 457-3209. Ask for Leo. Tell him Freddie said to hire you. And I literally just on my hand wrote down 457-3209, Leo. And then I looked at him and he goes, that's it, go. You and I in. went back to my table. I was shaking. I was smoking at the time. So I like smoked my cigarette. I'm like, holy shit. And I literally called that number and a guy named Leo answered. Super amazing guy who's like brilliant into all the, you know, the four agreements? Yes. Love yeah. That. So he, <laughs> him and Don Miguel Ruiz were best friends, Leo. And poor Leo had to hire me, even though I had no qualifications whatsoever. <laughs> but I got that job. Because mm -hmm. you had balls. You had balls. Had you balls. had no fear. And you went Faith, up. <laughs> naivete, stupidity, whatever, whatever. And all, all together. Yeah. And the second month I was working where there, one of the most beautiful women I had ever seen had come in. And she was a client. And she was very sad, but very beautiful. And I was just so Pollyannic. I was so like excited about life because all these doors were opening for me. Mm -hmm. And I was <laughs> blabbing about how, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to write a book one day and I'm going to do this and I'm going to get a Volvo XC90. And she started cracking up. It was like one of the first times I ever seen her crack a smile. And I was like, what's so funny. And she's like, that's your dream. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, they're fucking amazing cars. She goes, Oh, I know. I just, not a Ferrari, not a Porsche. I'm like, mm -hmm. ew, gross. Yeah. I'm like, That's guys crazy. that drive Ferraris and Porsches typically have little peepees <laughs> and they're always alone. And um, not all of them. There's obviously some really you know, amazing I know what you mean. Yeah. men that have Ferraris. But in general, in LA, when you see a dude driving a Ferrari or Lamborghini, you kind of cringe a little. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I want a Volvo XC90. And she's laughing up. I'm like, why is that so funny? She goes, um... I can make that happen for you. I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I can't get it now. I don't have any credit. My, my credit score is like a 430. Mm -hmm. And she's like, so what? And I'm like, no, trust me. I've explored every avenue. I can't get any loan right now. I don't even have a checking account. She goes, honey, I work in the finance department at Rusnik Volvo in Pasadena. Oh my gosh. I'm like, what does that mean? She goes, that means if you want a Volvo, I'll get your Volvo, but mm -hmm. you got to promise to make the payments and don't fuck me over. I'm like, is this really happening? First of all, pretty unethical for me to be engaging with a client like that. But at the time, yeah. desperate times call for desperate measures. Yeah. And when she graduated and she got out and she stayed sober, she contacted me and she said, come on in and pick out your car and we're going to make it happen. And I ended up getting that Volvo SUV. My first one was an all black one with the beautiful black wheels. And wow. just, I don't know, like I could tell you 10,000 stories like that where, no, I didn't watch The Secret. And then I woke up in the morning and there was a Volvo in my driveway with a bow on. It doesn't right. work like that. Right. No. Nope. I got up. I worked. I did my prayers. I meditated. I did my hikes. I did my incantations. I was taught to trust God, clean house and help others, which is what I did. Even when I didn't want to, mm -hmm. I remember my, my sponsor telling me, you got to put a dollar in the basket. And I was like, fuck you. You put a dollar in the basket. You're rich. And he's like, Khalil, you have to put a dollar in the basket. I'm like, I'm homeless. And he goes, right. And you taking the money that I paid you to detail my car and putting a percentage of it tithing which I didn't know anything about tithing, mm -hmm. putting a percentage of it in that basket is showing God that you have faith that more is coming. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, gave me goosebumps. It works. It works though, right? It works. You yeah. Live it. I'm living it. I'm living it. I hope I get to meet your your followers, your your the people that listen to your podcast. If you see me in Sun Life Organics, come up to me. It, inevitably, I'm going to be talking to somebody because I never shut the fuck up, as you noticed. <laughs> um, but I want to meet you. Um, I would love a hug if you feel comfortable with that. I would love to treat you. And um, I would love to, you know, drink a smoothie with you, whoever you are. And um, and I hope all my babbling has given somebody some hope somewhere. Amazing. Khalil, you've dropped so many mic drop messages, one-liners. 
I have so much to take away from this. I know everybody does. And I can't wait to, to be with you in person too. So I know everyone's gonna follow you. Everyone's gonna find you and those that are committed and they're gonna create their own luck through opportunity and working hard are gonna absolutely get that hug with you. Oh, I can't wait. I need hugs and I love you guys. Thank you for listening. And thank you for asking me to come on here. Oh, thank you for being here.